Joining me now from Cardiff in Wales is Professor Patrick Minford, former economic advisor to Margaret Thatcher. He now teaches applied economics at the Cardiff Business School in Wales. Professor, welcome to the show. Uh, John Major, who replaced her, mm -hmm. said that she was the right leader for the right time. Would you agree? Yes, I would. I think we were very lucky because uh, the, the, the 1970s was a terrible time for Britain. And uh, she came in in 1979 and really started to make a, a huge difference very quickly. Inflation was brought down in the early 80s after a, a very difficult period of fiscal consolidation and monetary squeeze. And then she set about union reforms and generally improving com competition in the economy, um, privatization, all those reforms that made such a difference to the performance of the British economy in the 80s. Professor, I heard this story about uh, a member of parliament seeing a friend of his who was an aide to uh, Thatcher and he was running, his, his hair was uh, uh, kind of messed up and he was disheveled and the friend said, hey, slow down, uh, Rome wasn't built in a day and the guy turned around and, and screamed and, and you're smiling, you already know the, uh, the zinger here, the guy screamed, uh, yes, but Maggie wasn't the foreman on that job. Um, what was she like to work for? Did she, did she push you pretty hard? Yes, she was a very, a very tough uh, person to, to kind of be dealing with because she wanted to get everything absolutely right. And she was very cautious. And uh, so she had these long, long seminars uh, with people outside the government and inside the government in which she pressed everybody very hard and wouldn't take, you know, um, uh, no for an answer, if you like. And she constantly questioned what they told her and they had to stand their ground and explain very carefully what what they thought and she would then test it out and this went on and on and a lot of people didn't realize quite how cautious she was before she embarked on the details of the reforms that she actually implemented but she was cautious yet she was tough and firm and uh, there were victims of this I mean uh, uh, unemployment rose to above three million in 81 her uh, her approval rating dropped about 25 percent. Um, were there times where she even questioned her own methods? No, I don't think so, but she did realize that she was up against much bigger problems than she thought at the first. And I think that was the general view, certainly among, you know, those that advised her, like me, because I think we were all surprised by how dreadful the state of the British economy was um, when inflation was brought down. It became quite clear that the, the inflation itself and all the subsidies that had created it had been propping up large tracts of our economy that really were in very, very bad shape. And when the, 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 the subsidies and the inflation was taken away, it became really apparent that we'd had virtually no major industries that were competitive. And naturally, we, we had this terrible unemployment, but we had no idea how bad it was until the inflation was cured and we could see the actual details and so I think she was very shocked by that and no one expected that unemployment would, would stay so high for so long because they thought that once inflation was cured somehow unemployment would go back to to normal but the underlying problem of lack of competitiveness was what created the unemployment and that had to be tackled before the unemployment would come down. So you have people who are unemployed, large numbers, and then the other criticism, which kind of coupled with this, is that uh, there were those who accused her of shifting the tax burden from the rich to the poor. Well, the point was that she had to cut public spending and the, the books had to be balanced. You couldn't run the economy with very large budget deficits as had been going on at the end of the 1970s. And so she had to tackle the, the, the consolidation of the budget. And that meant that taxes had to be raised. Now, as you know very well, you can't raise all the taxes from the rich. So the, the general burden of taxation had to go up. While public spending was brought down, nevertheless, it couldn't be brought down sufficiently to avoid raising taxes. The other thing that she faced was the need to, to create incentives for entrepreneurs. And so she had to cut the top marginal tax rates to bring them down to sort of common sense levels. As you know, they were as high as 80 percent on ordinary working wages of top, top executives and so forth. This was much too high to get entrepreneurs of innovating and get the economy going again. So she had to do all these things. But what you have to remember is that when she cut the top marginal tax rate, she brought in a lot more revenue, the old Laffer curve argument. 
What about uh, her role in politics, in, in terms of how it's shifted there in England? I mean, uh, the, the, the mirror here in the West uh, in the United States would be Ronald Reagan, who was also uh, popular during that period of time. They were almost twins in many respects in how they approached things. Um, and, and there are those here in the United States who say because of Reagan, uh, the left, the Democrats, have shifted far more to the center. Um, do you see that change as well in England? Is that one of the, uh, the long-term impacts that she's had? Oh, definitely. Um, I mean, Tony Blair himself has explained that this was, this was the reason that forced him to move um, the Labour Party's policies um, to, to, the, to the center, away from the left. And, of course, he wanted to do that anyway, but he, he had no option, and he's made that very, very clear. And I think that Ed Miliband, the current Labour leader, has also explained that uh, that, that she had that effect on the politics of his party. So undoubtedly the Labour Party changed enormously and it brought in um, no reversals really of her policies. I mean there were a few things in l the labour market that were changed which I don't entirely welcome but the, br the vast swathe of her policies were not reversed by the Labour Party when they got into power in 1997. What about the divisive quality of her, though? I mean, there, there were those who loved her and then those who, who hated her. I mean, even now you mm. see uh, people going this makeshift memorial putting flowers there, but others are putting uh, jugs of milk because of this, uh, you know, when she was the education mm. secretary, she was Thatcher Thatcher, mm. milk snatcher. Um, there were those who mm. kind of saw her as shredding the safety net, the social safety net. Um, what made her so divisive, do you think? Well, she didn't shred the social safety set. You've really got to realize that that's completely wrong. The safety net was kept very strong and, in fact, if anything, increased because what she did was, as she made it uh, important for people to get back to work, she increased benefits in work. So she definitely didn't shred the social safety net. On the contrary, she was very scrupulous about maintaining it and strengthening it. Strengthening it. But I think on the issue of divisive, I mean, it was Tony Blair who who answered that. He said, look, come on, if you decide, you divide. Anybody who is going to um, take difficult decisions is going to divide people. And a sign of not being divisive is that you don't take any decisions. So she certainly took a lot of decisions and she was bound to be divisive because there were obviously many vested interests um, ranged against her. But language also can be uh, kind of tough and she, you know, Referring to the unions as the enemy within rather than, uh, you know, a, 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 just an opponent, um, those are kind of strong words as well. That, that kind of led to the divisive quality as well, didn't it? Well, but, you know, this was against the background of um, a, a, a union movement that was gearing up for war. And as we later saw, the, the miners struck without a ballot, and uh, they were basically bent under Arthur Scargill on toppling her politically. So it was political war declared by the union movement that she was re referring to. So that, uh, you know, uh, when she said we've dealt with um, G G G General Galtieri uh, as the enemy without and now we've got to deal with the enemy within, she wasn't far wrong in terms of the war that was being declared by her union enemies. Her public persona, the, the Iron Lady, but you knew her in private. How did uh, the private... Maggie Thatcher differ from the public Maggie Thatcher? Well, uh, many people have commented on that who, who knew her, that she was very, very, uh, uh, very interested in people's personal lives and incredibly considerate and um, a, a really charming and um, sort of compassionate person in terms of her personal relationships. And so, of course, this was the, the part that she couldn't afford to show in public because people might have thought she was a soft touch. But uh, I can remember occasions, you know, when late at night one was going off from a long seminar and she would say, well, you must, you must uh, wait and I'll cook you an omelette, you know, and before you go on that long journey. And this is the sort of thing. She was full of those sorts of personal touches. Professor Minford, thank you so much for joining us. Certainly appreciate it. It was a pleasure.